I have been barred, and this is an exclusive, I think, actually, from two gay bars in Newcastle. I was told that I was homophobic. And I said, oh, well, this is... <laughs> This is news to me. The culture is so ingrained in this leftist blob. These days, walking around with a Louis Vuitton bag isn't ex as exciting as walking around with your views and values on your Twitter account. Whereas I think actually being gay is the least interesting thing about me. We're going to follow the state of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and actually tell you that, no, you're in, you were born in the wrong body, we're going to say that you're uh, Martha, not Arthur, and uh, eradicate the homosexuality. I was being quite badly pushed around and bullied at school. Back then, I would have looked for absolutely anything to tell me that I wasn't gay. I, God's on hand on heart, cried myself to sleep all night. And, um... Do you think the trans rights activism has made life a little bit more difficult for gay people. Darren Grimes, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Big fan. Oh, I'm a big fan. Ah, well, yeah. there we are. Good start. <laughs> You're from Newcastle. Yeah, well, I'm from Durham, actually. Okay. I live right. in Newcastle. Do people yeah. say often that, because you can interrupt if it is the thing that they say, that you could the third of two brothers? Oh, Ant and Dick. Yeah. Yeah. Because the accent and it's just a look, isn't there? What yeah, is that? yeah. I heard it's called having a big forehead. Is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> but handsome men, the three of you. Well, I mean, I just met them actually at Crystal Palace at a Ooh. Newcastle United game uh, at Selhurst Park. And it was the first time I'd ever met them. And I walked up to them and said, my man will never forgive us if I don't get a picture with you. So I had to do that. So the comments, exactly what you just said. Were you separated at birth? Oh, oh that's so <laughs> funny. And, and also, that's an interesting point because you are a, a right-wing commentator, right? And and even if you're not a right-wing, whatever that means, if you're just someone who talks against the mainstream, it's why you're on Heretics, of course, going up to a mainstream celebrity and asking for a photo with them, that means something. W were you concerned they might go, fuck off, did they know who you were? I was absolutely certain that they wouldn't know who I was. So I was quite confident in that. Mm. And uh, fortunately, they didn't, because I doubt they would have taken the picture yeah. if they did. <laughs> and then now they might be looking back going, oh, God. And you don't want your heroes thinking, oh, oh no, no, I know. I'm I'll get them in trouble or whatever else. Yeah, <sighs> absolutely. God. It's uh, what a world we live in, though. It's really depressing uh, that you've got to constantly think about these things and be concerned about getting someone into trouble and whether it be in day-to-day -day life as well, you know, your dating life and all the rest of that as well, that's pretty mm -hmm. uh, impossible when you're someone on the right in a in a gay world. Are you, you're, really so you are gay. Are you single? Yeah. I am, yes. Anyone out there? Anyone want to? <laughs> Especially, this is the right audience, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it is. This yeah, is the right absolutely. Audience. Anyone out there? I was just in Sitges. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, very gay. The gay hotspot <laughs> of the Brighton of Barcelona, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Um, and I ended up chatting to a very lovely gay couple who were friends of friends of friends of my wife. I don't know. We all ended up talking, but I got to that inevitable part in the discussion where, you know, and I was already thinking, what am I going to say? Because they're going to say, what do you do? And I thought, I cannot have them when I'm sat in the restaurant yeah. looking up and the first thing they see is like, trans women are not yeah. women yeah. and stuff like that. Is, is that. I mean, that's something you have to deal with all the time. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. I mean, it's a, I'm grateful in a way and hear me out hmm. because it's sort of, it allows you to be able to separate the good from the bad. Filter. Like if someone's not willing to actually hear you out and have a conversation with you, then they're frankly, in my view, intolerant and intolerable. And therefore, I want nothing to do with them anyway. So it's a pretty good way of, you know, being able to actually find out who's worth talking to, because mm -hmm. I'll talk to anyone. Um, and, you know, my ex worked for CNN. Oh, so, well, you know, that's it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that voted for Jeremy Corbyn. So that's a left-right uh, divide. And it, it wasn't a problem until his friends actually started to, I I think, sort of stir the pot, say, what, guess what Darren's been saying online, blah, blah, blah. And then that was the end of that. So Cult. Yeah. This, this is what I worry about with my wife, um, if, if it gets back to her profession somehow. Yeah, because 
just, you know, it's the vocal minority they might be, but they're very vocal. Oh, yeah. And she could get in all sorts, you know, and she doesn't necessarily share any of my views or anything. And but. they're massive activists as well. It's a wonder that they've got time to go to work or do anything, frankly. <laughs> they don't, because going to work on time is racist, well, yeah. as, as <laughs> yeah. I've heard. Anyway, <laughs> is, is the gay dating world um, woker? Because I know a lot of gay people are very anti the woke stuff as well. I thought, I lived in London for six years, worked in London for six years, and then I went back uh, during lockdown. Mm. Being in a pokey flat in London during lockdown was suboptimal, to say the least. And my yeah. heart goes out to everyone, especially with families in that scenario. And uh, I moved back and I bought a place in Newcastle. I love Newcastle. It's It was my sanctuary growing up and uh, it remains where my heart is to this day. And I always thought in Newcastle, you wouldn't have a problem in that sense, in the sense of being met by a wall of intolerance. But I've, I have been barred, and this is an exclusive, I think, actually, Ooh. from two gay bars in Newcastle, uh, which I've been going to since I was 17, don't tell anyone. <laughs> and I was told that I was homophobic. And I said, oh, well, this is, <laughs> this is news to me. Wow. Um, and I think they meant transphobic. Uh, but And that was the charge by some drag queen who had said, I'm upset by what he's saying or said online, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I love drag acts. I've got nothing against that. I, I like watching them. I find them fun. Mm. Uh, I just think they ought to be age appropriate. Sure. Uh, but saying all of that, you're viewed as a heretic, dare I say, use that word. And yeah, that was it. They said, you, you're not welcome to come back. And I, I said, well, I could have actually pursued that under the Equality Act, because I think you'll find that actually it's a phil philosophically held belief that's protected. Yes. Uh, Thanks, Maya Forstetter. Absolutely. Mm. So I thought about it. And then I thought, you know what, I'd actually just rather not give them my money. Yeah. So that was that. But yes, the uh, answer to that question is it it's everywhere it's pervasive uh, i think especially among my generation mm. there are signs that the next generation are, are getting better i've got a brother that's eight years younger than i am yeah. how old are you i'm 30 okay uh and his generation seemed to be a lot more open-minded okay they're gonna push back I yeah think. i think so that that's the rebellious streak right because the culture is so ingrained in this leftist blob this quagmire of of intolerance and uh, so-called social justice movements that are nothing that uh, they are the total opposite in my opinion uh and i think actually the rebellion will be to say well, I stand against identity politics. I think it's divisive. I think actually it doesn't have good outcomes. And uh, I, I think I'm quite excited, actually, and I'm quite optimistic mm. uh, about the future, seeing all of the things that have been kicking off recently. I've got big news. Heretics is expanding to Substack. I'll be writing weekly articles about the madness of the woke mind virus and also giving out little snippets and things I've learned from episodes with new guests that haven't even gone live on YouTube yet. In just six months, you grew this community from zero to 150,000 subscribers. But Heretics is expensive to run. With its camera team, guest booker, production assistant, top of the range 4K cameras, moving sliders, editors, and social media, it costs about 10,000 pounds or $13,000 a month. How can you help? Well, I don't want to rely on ads. You, the viewers, are the economic engine that will drive heretics to the next level. I'm talking about tours, time to make longer episodes, and bigger guests. This month on Substack, I am writing about the email I received that cancelled me from my own book tour, the 10 signs that gender ideology is a cult, and whether Britain and the US are racist countries. You'll also get the ad-free podcast early and be able to ask questions to my guests so you'll really be part of the Heretics community. Most of the content is free with perks for paid members. My first article is up now, and it's something I've been holding back and wanting to get off my chest for a long time. So go and sign up on andrewgoldheretics.substack.com. Yeah. 
then you can go for a younger man. Not not sort of Milo Yiannopoulos kind of <laughs> no. what he was saying, but like a Stephen Fry young man. Maybe is maybe that kind of Well, he I gets mean, I don't, oh, that's probably pushing it a little bit as well, given I'm 30. How old? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, well, <laughs> yeah. By the time this happens, <laughs> yes, you'll yes. be 50. Yes. And you can go with the 30 year old. Potentially so, potentially so. Yes. yes. And there is, I'm just, just sweating now. <laughs> I'm not saying the Milo stuff or the Kevin Spacey stuff. I'm saying the Stephen Fry thing. Because he's, he's what, 60 something? Uh, yes, he must be. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Boyfriend's 20s, 30s. Uh, I, I think he's in his 30s now, but yeah, at the time when they married, mm. yeah. Well, if, if DiCaprio can do it. Well, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. How did it feel, actually feel? I mean, now when we look back, it's sort of almost, it, I, I, at least I find it, it sort of adds to the story when it's a cancellation. But when these two gay clubs in your hometown have said to you, no, you're out. I mean, it didn't feel very nice, it, I, I'll admit. It was, it's quite an ostracizing, isolating thing to happen. Um, but I sort of, I sort of accepted that if I, if I pursued this, whatever this is, I have no idea what I'm actually doing. Mm. Uh, and I spoke up for people like my mother, who I am incredibly close to. Yeah. Um, so I knew when I actually, I guess, championed in whatever small way I can, the, the views and values that I was brought up with, whether that be my grand, late grandfather, my mother, uh, whoever else, that there would be a price because that's just the world we live in today. Uh, I think we, and I've used that word several times already, but I think we are becoming more intolerant. Uh, and that's, it's quite ironic actually, because that's what I'm always accused of being. Yeah. Um, and I would argue I'm not, but I knew that there would be, it's these days walking around with a Louis Vuitton bag isn't ex as exciting as walking around with your mm -hmm. views and values on your Twitter account or all over your social media, whether it be posting a, a black square during the Black Lives Matter insanity, as I would call it, or whether it be uh, during the COVID pandemic to say that you've had more vaccinations than goodness only knows what. Um, the, all these things, it's a, it's a it's a luxury good signalling, and I'm afraid that I and my views are not luxury goods in not the fashionable. cultural or fashionable in the cultural uh, parameters that we're now operating. Mm. Someone described it uh, as nostalgie de la boue the other day, the nostalgia of the mud, the, the French apparently, and I don't know when it was, 1900. That's how good I am. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But there was a point <laughs> in time where the French middle classes or middle upper classes, to differentiate themselves from the others, to be a bit cool and different, would act like they were uh, proletariats and working Yes. Class. Yeah, I think I think there's something about that. I mean, it, it's typical sort of uh, Marxism 101, really, where, you, you know, your identity isn't about uh, what your lived experiences have been, but it's about who you are with your immutable characteristics and all these other things. That They're what makes you interesting. Whereas I think actually being gay is the least interesting thing about me. I think uh, being uh, from a council estate in County Durham, I would like to see more people in politics that had actually had that experience over being booked. I'm not saying you've booked me for that reason, mm. but being booked onto things because of your sexuality, which is how I got my start in this world through right. the BBC, your good friends. Ah. And <laughs> it was a it was BBC Generation 2015 uh, in 2014 for first time voters. And I, at that time, voted Liberal Democrat. I thought I was a Liberal. Uh, and I, they knew, they ask you all of these things, of course, a diversity checklist. And that's how I got my start at the BBC because of the fact that I ticked all the right boxes. Mm. But I'd rather not, you know, if, if I, were I to die tomorrow and touch what I won't, mm. uh, that that would be my epitaph, you know, that, that it would read um, that. That is the most interesting thing about being gay. Me. Being gay, yeah. Okay. Or whatever else. Do you think they were also, they wanted to, maybe because of being working class, would that have helped? It, no, I think actually being from the Northeast <laughs> was the only, the only thing they were looking for. They wanted okay. to actually get representation from all parts of the country. Mm. So, I don't think there were many, and that's quite sad, really. But I don't think there were many people from the northeast who would go for an opportunity like that because you just don't think that politics is something that you can get involved in if you come from a background like the one I did. Uh, you know, growing up, politics always felt like something that happened in Westminster, a place I'd never been to. Uh, I, I never went to London until I was what eighteen, nineteen. 
uh, and you feel removed from that process. Hmm. So I, I can't imagine they got many applicants. I see. But you've got something about you as well. You've got like a pizzazz. I mean, I think in another world, because you say you thought you were liberal back in the day. Yeah. Many of your views from what I've seen, I, I do consider to be liberal by what was liberal 20 years ago. Yes. Uh, and had we been in a different world, different political realm, do you think you could have been just a, an Anton Deck or, a, or a, a, this this morning or something? I, I mean, I would have loved to have done something like that, but uh, it ain't going to happen now, <laughs> the world we live in. But, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't really care about all of that. I care about, you know, me. I, I don't care about me. Uh, personally and what, what whatever happens to me because you can't do anything about that really but i care about ensuring that we can actually have the the debates and the discussions that ordinary people are having but you can't even do that these days you're absolutely right to say you know 20 years ago i probably would have been someone advocating that we uh have like the first debate I ever got involved in was around same sex marriage, mm -hmm. and I I support that uh, now. Mm -hmm. I don't think it should have you should coerce the church into doing it, but I think that you should be able to to get married and have parity in the law and pension rights and all these other important yeah. things. Uh, so that was the first discussion I ever got involved in. But nowadays, you know that that sort of. And Douglas Murray describes it as being like St. George in retirement, you know, the LGBT plus alphabet soup. They've slain the dragon, the dragon being the quest for equality. They've secured that. And now they're looking for sheep to slaughter on the hills mm -hmm. of uh, goodness only knows where. So it, we've moved so far away from what were laudable liberal classic in the classical sense. Civil values. rights. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's really sad. It is. It is. And, and dignity. There was this, the, I grew up and like the, the gay pride and the fight for civil rights was about dignity and yeah. about having uh, the same rights as other people. But anyone who gets those rights, there's always going to be a few people who want more. And there were people, for, of course, who work in those fields. That's what I think a lot of it is down to money. There's yeah. a lot of people working in diversity and ethnicity and all these kinds of things. And once you've hit your targets, what, you're unemployed? Well, you can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. that can't be the case. You have to find more and more things to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. And the pressure that groups like Stonewall put on all of these big banks and all the rest of it to actually mm. uh, pay money and be part of their diversity uh, list, which is the top 100 companies to work for if you're LGBT, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, they bend over backwards to meet these specifications and requirements, which are ever growing, ever expanding. You would think that as we become uh, more quote unquote progressive as a society, that those things would be, there would be fewer check boxes to take, but actually there are more because there's an ever increasing number of identities and things you can uh, self-identify with. So uh, the whole, the, you're absolutely right to say that nowadays it wasn't back in my day and that's not that long ago right yeah, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't all a big scam like it is today i had one of those stonewall mugs oh. when i was a teenager you know some people are gay get over it i had one of those i paid for it with my own money and there wasn't a lot of that about when i was a kid uh i don't mean as an actual child but a teenager and i was proud to have that i wouldn't dare now no way jose do you think the trans rights activism has made life a little bit more difficult for gay people. Undoubtedly it has, because I, I think, you know, when when I think back to my own uh, upbringing, I, my mom has incredibly poor taste in men. <laughs> and I think she'll, she'll agree with that sentiment. Yeah, I think a lot of mums. <laughs> well, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and uh, her, her um, ex-husband uh, liked a drink, shall we say, and he wasn't too relaxed about uh, homosexuality. Shit. Yeah. So uh, I was being called a, a puff and a uh, whatever else from a very, quite an early age. Mm. And I never even understood what that meant. So I think all of those lived experiences, to, if I can co opt the language of the social justice movement, have, uh, were responsible for, for me getting involved in that initial activism. Um, and if I look back to those really quite desperate times where I was going to school, I was being quite badly pushed around and bullied at school, 
a, a lad nearly put my eye out once oh. by throwing it was it sounds daft but throwing coins but there were like a pack of them and if one of them gets you in your eye you yeah, know yeah. so cuts ac across the face and you go to the school nurse and what i fear now is that back then i would have looked for absolutely anything to tell me that I wasn't gay hmm. because I absolutely did not want that to be the the answer to just accept that I wanted to and I knew from the age of about 11 you know you hear something enough times and, and um perhaps it it, it has a, a knock on effect but I I would say I was sort of dragged out of of the closet or to that understanding and I look at myself back then and I I'm genuinely this isn't intended to be hyperbole or for clicks or anything like that. But I worry that I would have looked for any explanation and said, well, maybe, you know, quite effeminate, you know, I guess you could say quite uh, stereotypical in some ways. Maybe, maybe a trans outcome would be a better outcome. You know, if, if a school nurse sits there and says, well, have you explored all of these gender identity yeah. options and all these other things? When actually I was just a, a, a gay lad who was deeply, well, not, I did accept it, but deeply willing to look for absolutely anything that would be an alternative to, to say, this isn't what my life's going to be. Because, you know, I remember the night where I first realised you definitely are gay. I was 11, 11 years old, and I, God's on, hand on heart, cried myself to sleep all night. And um, looking back at those times, I, I just think of the number of kids who could be in similar positions. Vulnerable kids who are going to be swayed by what so-called responsible adults are telling them. And I don't think they are so-called responsible adults. I think, I think they're activists. And all, all I needed at that time was, you know, someone to talk to, to confide in. Uh, and I, I worry that that's not happening for the, the next generation of kids. But, you know, maybe we're advancing to a point where you know, kids don't feel as I did, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure we are going to if they're t being told that actually the solution is that you know you're you're not gay. You're a, a trans child, and uh, medical pathways and interventions could be whether that be hormones and all the rest of it are the solution. I think it's a deeply homophobic mm. position that we've ended up in. So that's why I'm so passionate about it. And imagine if I was able to have a pint with someone in Newcastle in those bars that I'm banned from and articulate that position like I hope I've been able to in the brief time that we've had together, I would like to think that people would say, all right, maybe I understand his point of view. But instead, we live in an age in which you are immediately called every ism or phobia in the book. I've been called all of them and told that you'll be cancelled and all the rest of it. I used to do uh, the BBC's uh, broadcasting house. You know, I don't think that would, which is a paper review show for it, those that don't know. And I don't think that <clears> would ever happen again. Um, all of those things, all of the, 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 just the, the direction we're going in when it comes to speech and debate and at the, uh, the advancing of, of ideas to actually reach conclusions that are good and important and necessary. We're, we've strayed so far away from that. Uh, and I worry, I worry about the direction we're going in. And I especially worry for those kids who may be in positions like the one I was in. Because, I mean, the <clears throat> the uh, Tavistock Clinic, the NHS uh, Gender Identity Clinic for Kids, they uh, did a, well, there was a whistleblower report through Newsnight, BBC Newsnight. Now, honestly, I don't praise the BBC often, but it was the best thing I'd ever seen from the BBC and there were kids saying uh, that they'd been put through this because their parents would prefer a trans outcome over a gay outcome. You know, that 
that to me is not progress. That That is as regressive as you can possibly be. That is homophobia 101 yeah. to actually say, we're going to follow the state of Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, and actually tell you that, no, you're in, you were born in the wrong body. We're going to say that you're uh, Martha, not Arthur, and uh, eradicate the homosexuality. Because that does happen mm -hmm. in Iran. It happens in several Asian countries and who knows where, where else. So that impulse, as, as much as people would like to say, oh, that's the you're a bogeyman, that's not a real, what you're talking about, or a straw man, that impulse in humans, especially humans who don't like gay people, is is there for everybody to see. That does happen. Well, it was happening here. You know, the, the, the Tavistock, <clears throat> the, those whistleblower reports said so. Yeah. Uh, and I don't care if it's only like a handful of examples, only. That's, you know, a few kids too many, mm -hmm. in my opinion, that could have changed themselves in ways in which they're going to look at their bodies in the future when they're adults and think, what on earth have I done to myself? And that then starts a spiral of you were depressed when you did all of this and you were looking for answers, but you're depressed now yeah. and looking for answers at what decisions you were told were good for you by so-called responsible adults. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't think any of the anything that I've just said there is articulating a, a bigoted or transphobic argument. No. I think it's rational. It's it's based in in fact evidence, and it's based in uh, again lived experience. I was, I was thinking when you did articulate so, so brilliantly you, how you just spoke that were there an audience, it, there would have been a standing ovation because it was so beautifully put. And I, I'm so sorry you went through that growing up. I really am. No, no that, that, please. I mean, I, you know, I, I've done well out of it now. Um, I, I'm, I'm quite grateful actually for the start that I had in life. You know, Margaret Thatcher once said that uh, she was grateful for, she had two things growing up. She had good parents, I had one, and uh, no money. Because if you've got no money, you have to bloody well work for it. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, I you did could that. Have done, you could have done without the homophobia. Though. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Did yeah. you, and, and I honestly don't mean this in a facetious way, mm. did you watch Billy Elliot? Did you, was that like an idol for you from, from Newcastle? No, wasn't it? it wasn't. Yeah, well, uh, actually from County Durham. So that oh, was, yeah. Uh, right, uh, yeah. Uh, so as, as perfect as you can possibly get. But, uh, Watching that kind of thing growing up, I wouldn't oh, have wanted to because oh. because I would be worried that uh, I don't know you, you, you someone might you. crack a joke oh. and be like, "Oh, look, it's you" or something like that, and then I would feel like, uh "Oh, yeah. I was worried about being gay." I mean, everyone, every and any man who do, who doesn't admit to that is is either lying to themselves. Or, or just doesn't think adolescence, enough. puberty, yeah. all of these things. You're we knew, thinking about we knew it was things. Bad. It was like this. I mean, obviously not bad, but we knew it would be seen as bad. Yeah. And I, was, you're 11. You're like, oh, what am I going to yeah. like? Girls or boys? What's going? Yeah, yeah. Oh, what if I'm gay? What and does that, this mean? Oh, yeah. What a panic I had about that. Yeah. But the, one of the issues that, I mean, that that you've touched on, I think this this applies to all of us really. And Andrew Doyle talks about this, of course, a lot. Is that once you talk about these things, once you're honest about them, you're banned from everywhere else. And so you can't then, for example, this this podcast, I'd love to have a more diverse range, uh, but I can't just no. ask David Beckham to come on or or someone who's not very famous, but it's just like middle ground and wants to talk about what I, they won't cut. There's no way they'll come on. They don't. I try sometimes. Yeah. So you're then stuck with just that. And then everyone accuses you of being in a bubble when you're only on one side. Um, Andrew Doyle often talks about like he likes um, poetry and literature and like that's what he wants to be doing. And instead you're just like, okay, no, but 99%. I, I like to doing cults and that stuff. Yeah. We're stuck in this one thing because yeah. we can't talk anymore. Yeah. Ideologically siloed. Yeah. Uh, and that gets you nowhere. So. Uh, I think the one good thing that I've enjoyed about my time at, at GB News actually is the fact that uh, we are regulated by Ofcom and you have to have opinions from the other side. It's very difficult to get the other side sometimes, but on my show on a Saturday night, for example, uh, I'm sat next to oh, two seats down from Benjamin Butterworth, who right. is as woke, I mean, so woke it's a wonder he ever sleeps. You know? I didn't know that was a person until Lawrence Fox said it because it sounds like a cartoon character. I mean, that's, I'm not. I'm not being fair because it's, it's his name. <laughs> it's his name. He doesn't. Mean, it sounds like Benjamin Button. And, yeah, uh, yes, it does. he must have been annoyed when that film came out. I, know, I imagine. Imagine it was a book before. I don't yeah, know. But yeah, yeah, That brought it to the and it's ah, oh, why? Yes. Why in my life? I'm sure he's a lovely guy, but is very woke. But also then, so this is. I was just having this debate with Calvin Robinson, as you saw when you you came in. We had a nice hello and everything, but he. He doesn't think Lawrence Fox should have been in trouble for saying I wouldn't shag that about Ava. 
uh, and that Dan for for sort of smiling was then, and then he was also fired, Calvin for just saying they shouldn't have been fired. Are you even? I mean, I don't want to push put you in. No, the no. can't talk about it. Um, I <clears throat> I found that all of that that entire saga really really depressing. I mean, to be honest with you, like you know, I I was I was brought up uh, almost exclusively around women, so hearing that kind of thing, like I I it it doesn't. I find it icky, hmm. but is finding it icky really a, a reason to have pages after pages of uh, web articles and hmm. news reels saying all reporting it as actual news? I don't think it was. I don't think it was ever actual news. Hmm. Uh, I think, I think it was a, a daft thing to say, to be honest. But yeah. each to their own. He's a big bloke. He can. Hmm take care of himself and he said that he was he was referring to the ideology that she has i wouldn't shag that right. rather than making her into an object of, right which which is a bit bad so yeah i don't i mean i must admit i haven't watched the, the interview that you did with them uh i did watch the interview that you did with the the itv uh football commentator who used mm. to be in the women's team oh any luca that's it yeah. uh and i thought that was phenomenal but oh, that's a you. sign of you actually being able to reach out across the ideological so divide few will yeah which is why and when good I tweeted for her for doing yeah, it, to be honest, that's what I said. When I tweeted it out, I said, you know, good for her for doing yeah. it. But we then did sort of fall out a bit uh, messaging, right? <laughs> okay, but that, it which tends to happen, yeah. unfortunately. You try, you try so hard because we do have, and I, and I see that in you as well. We were like, like that idea of, hey, we can all be different and have these yeah. different views. But it was difficult because um, she continued tweeting, you know, just just what I thought, and again, it's all my opinion. Was bonkers stuff mm -hmm. uh it, it, about the interview and stuff like that and then i continued saying like god that was a car crash and then she was messaging like oh right you're saying it's a car crash to me you said it was good i was like yeah well, i didn't want to hurt you i'm not going to say to you straight after the thing like that was a car crash am i um by the way if i tell if i tell you this is good i i mean <laughs> it and it wasn't a car crash but unfortunately it's just like two ideologies that I suck. we just couldn't and we we did have a bit of a falling i out. mean it's itv all over and the, de the decline of that broadcaster oh, yeah. which used to actually appeal to you know i, I remember I remember growing up watching uh, all of the trash telly that ITV would put out, but it actually used to speak to communities like that, which I'm from, and yeah. it doesn't anymore. It's it's all about it's it's a box ticking exercise. I don't. I'm up, fair play to the last. I don't know if she had a a good successful career as a women's footballer. If she did, quite good, and phenomenal, great, perfect, good for her. But I don't think she's a good commentator. I think objectively she's a pretty poor commentator. Mm. Listening to the Euros coverage, I mean, yeah, she's she's dropped quite a few clangers over yeah. the years. The and of, people clip them up now as well. I know. And then I wonder. I know, but if we put that much, if we really looked at like the the white guys doing it, they'd probably say some. I mean, they definitely yeah, say like, some. Like oh, absolutely, things. absolutely. I it, I dare say uh, there are a lot of them. Uh, Michael Owens probably said some pretty daft things in his time. Uh, but uh, I think it's when ITV, basically, if, if you insist on having an all-women panel, then is is this the best you could find, would be my argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unfor well, <laughs> unfortunately, you've always got to find some who are footballers, right? And the footballers do often say stupid things, Yeah. but the men and the women. Yeah. And then you've got the sort of the Gabby Logans, who's a presenter, and she's yes. very, very good. So the presenters have to be good. Yeah. Oh yeah, because a lot of people want that job. Oh my goodness! I wouldn't yeah. mind that job. No, but I'm not allowed to be on. <laughs> no, TV. no, no, absolutely no, not. Neither of us are heresy. So, yeah, we wouldn't be allowed on it. Uh, do you think ITV is is that the worst one? Maybe now. I think since since Murdoch sold Sky News, mm. having a daily climate change show is pretty out there. Okay. Um. So, but I yeah, I'd, I'd say ITV is the worst one. Yeah. How is it we're in a country that for decades, it probably won't now, but has, has voted conservative and the TV channels tend to be so woke and ridiculous? I mean, Comcast bought Sky News, so that's they are way off to the left in America. There's sort of liberal left in the American sense of the word. Hmm. Uh, and uh, ITV, it's, it's all a, a clamour for keeping advertisers on board and advertisers now they they long for diversity equity and inclusion it's it's all a it's a vicious a vicious cycle and it it it's perpetuate perpetuated rather by a desire to be seen to be as progressive as you possibly can be uh 
I mean, I can't remember the last time I watched an advert that had a white family in it, for example, mm. right? So that's that's seen as yeah bad. And people would say, what? Well, oh, who cares? And I think what part of the reason that this is important, and I guess because I, I think from my own perspective, because of my old story about the BBC and all of that, is we forget about individuals. And we forget that there will have been individuals who care a lot about acting and being in those kinds of adverts. And where, where I have, I'm not, I'm less bothered is, is and as someone made the point recently, and it was about models, because models have always been about the fashions of the time. Mm. And, I, and I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of shit from models now, but I'm not <laughs> sure there's that much talent. In, but sorry, <laughs> it's probably the most, sometimes these things, like the little things I say, and you don't expect that to kick off. And that might be one of those things. Where, Do you know how much we have to <laughs> learn to stand in a particular one? I'm, I'm sure, yeah, but you're not exactly, you're not a truck driver doing no. 50 hours a day. Drive, you're not doing a garbage, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Those are hard jobs. The, that, that's uh, modeling, I'm sure. I mean, it must be boring. You must have to wait for loads of hours. But the point is, it was always done just based on very superficial qualities yes. that were the fashion so i think if it i don't if you want if, if it's fashionable now to have lots of different races in the modeling fine fill your boots i don't care in a, things like acting presenting news reporting that's where i feel like well hang on people's entire lives and careers are there when they should have the job are being pushed down so you can be fashionable and mm. that's scary yeah no it is it absolutely is and well i, I mean i guess in modeling as in all professions now uh you would see that it was very laudable back in the early days of, uh, I guess, uh, the the madness around and twenty four seven media, where fashion was uh, Naomi Clam Campbell's of the world and people like that, and it, black representation within the fashion industry, using that as the example, that was a laudable thing to do because there weren't many black people being represented in the world of fashion. Now though, you like you. are We've gone so far the other way that you can't you can't possibly have that many white people in because unless they've got I don't know some they're trans or something like that then it's okay <laughs> but they've got to meet any kind some sort of intersectionality in order to actually be permissible uh, and it's a I, I I don't see what's wrong with people wanting to see themselves reflected in the television shows they watch or in the um, uh, advertisements and products that they buy is that yeah. really so bad is, does that make you an inherently evil person i don't think so yeah yeah well like, but then they, the minorities would say the same thing hey i want to see someone who's black i want to see someone yeah so uh, naomi campbell you know uh, 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 fine right it's probably if we if we take a uh, a sub sample of what the ethnicity the makeup of the country is uh, then black and minority ethnic people in the media world or in the arts and industry are vastly overrepresented if we actually compare it to what the makeup of the country is. Um, so I, I think in a lot of ways uh, there is a there's, there's a sentiment that actually to to be uh, white is is to be pretty bad. Actually, mm. it's an inherently bad thing uh, to be, and to be straight white is very bad. I tweeted up something about this the other day in the audio industry because I, I when I was trying to the with, podcast industry yeah that. exactly so there's like the audio production and they mo they focus a lot on podcasts as well but they do other audio things as well and I happened to sort of find all of these pacts that have been set by really woke women um, mostly women that have sort of set the pacts up at places uh, like some of the biggest companies in audio where every panel you have to sign this thing every panel you have to have at least one or two uh minorities of some sort mm -hmm. jews don't count and i don't think disabled people do no. um but it's got to be that and there's like four people on the panel now very few people from minorities are applying to work in podcasting relatively it's like almost almost no one like they get you'll get like 100 cvs in for a job in audio and one might be black and then you have to hire that person mm -hmm. and you have to have that person on a panel and that kind of thing and all it does is the people who set these pacts who are at the top at the places like sony that that one black person who's very talented, they get them, and it leaves the lower down companies that want to compete with Sony with just like no one left, and it's just increasing that um, the, the gap between the big gun, the big guys, and the small guys. And it also creates a, a sense of injustice and unfairness oh, yeah. in the entire system. And I'm afraid to say, you know, we were going in the right direction, and we've already spoken about the gay issue, but I think even on the the race issue, we were totally in the right direction where we're saying, you know, content of your character and all the rest of it is is the only 
thing that we should actually be judging people on. Uh, and these days, yes, the colour of your skin is the only thing that matters. And I think that actually is what creates division and uh, resentment yeah. in society. And that's not good. We've got um, a vote coming up, which I didn't want to focus on too much just because I want people to backdate, like watch it in a year. And this, this, you know, but a lot of these things will still be relevant, which is that uh, we've got two parties that everyone, you know, Labour and Conservatives for, and I know people outside of Britain might not know, but it's it's Republicans and Democrats, basically a bit different. Um, but it sounds like reform, which is Nigel Farage's party, uh, might make some sort of impact. We don't know how much. We don't know how much people are just annoyed and they're saying it and then they won't actually vote or anything like that. But he's seen, I think, as a populist. I don't know what populism necessarily actually means anymore. I saw Winston Marshall doing a great speech, um, the debate with Nancy Pelosi, and he actually, because I went in going, come on, this is, uh, come on. And then I thought, oh, you know what? Maybe he's got a point. What is populism? So I would, I would, uh, I would first, I, I think, give you a few examples of, of where I actually perhaps became more comfortable with people attaching that to, to someone like me, for example, or, or uh, the voting patterns of my family. Uh, who have been through the whole um, uh, the the changing of the electoral roadmap? Where if if you come from a background like mine, you labour, right? You you put a red rosette on a donkey, and it would have won in County Durham. Mm. Uh, still the case in most parts of County yeah. Durham, to be fair. But you get the point. Now, though, their their voting patterns have have changed and moved more culturally right, but. That's what the old Labour Party used to be like. Um, so whether it be on the trans issue or whatever else, they all view this as a bit mad and alien. Um, and I I would put it down to things like Hillary Clinton's uh, basket of deplorables. You know, they're the ones voting for Trump. Mm. Uh, anyone that voted for Brexit is, as David Lammy, who's about to be our uh, foreign secretary potentially, uh, he compared Brexiteers to Nazis. Yeah. Um, they are uh, racist. They are bigoted. They are small-minded, uneducated. I remember I did a debate on Channel 4 and it was the uh, day after, or not long after, the referendum itself. And I, ca I campaigned for Brexit. Mm. And I was told by a former vice chairman of the Conservative Party that I was uneducated and that's why I voted the way I did. Mm. And I like, I don't have a degree, so I guess in that in that purely in crude sense, yeah, I guess I am uneducated compared to someone high and mighty like her. Mm. Oh, she's got a good point then. Right, see you, mate. Yeah, exactly. That's it. End yeah. of the podcast. I was a Remainer and I think I still would I still would be now. And but I have respect for democracy. Yeah. And I understand that not everybody who disagrees with me is a Nazi. Yeah. And and wanting to to actually use democracy to argue for the nation state, to argue that the nation state is the best vehicle to protect our rights and protect uh, the advancement of, of uh, working class issues, because they would argue that globalism hasn't, although it's had benefits as far as, you know, again, uh, if we go back only, what, 100 years, I could have died in childbirth, you know, that's, that's what, that was your lot. Um, capitalism has been great for advancing all of these technologies and healthcare initiatives that we take for granted now. But there is a sense of the size of everything that you're caught up in, your, your daily lives becoming bigger and things happening to you and the individual becoming a hell of a lot smaller and the individual feeling incredibly powerless. Uh, disenfranchised, uh, ostracized, isolated. And I think those are the voters who are saying, and they did this in 2016 in both Brexit and Trump. They did it a year earlier when 4 million people voted for UKIP. They did it in 2009 when some people voted for the BNP, who, by the way, I think are awful. Nick Griffin has called me out on on Twitter for for being a, a Zionist shill or something to that effect. He's a bastard. Uh, yeah, he is. He's a horrible fat ogre. And uh, uh, I I would rather that people didn't vote for parties like that. So if if being populist is actually ensuring that 
you strengthen the nation state, you strengthen the individual, you give people purchase over their own lives, you allow them to feel that they are part of the democratic system and it isn't something that's just happening to them. Or people in Westminster are so far removed from you that they might as well be in goodness only knows what, Elon Musk's new space centre in Mars or something like that. Uh, all of those things are what they, they term populist. I would describe myself as a national conservative. I think national populism, if you want to call it that, fine. But I think it all centers around the nation state and ensuring that you don't become a product of, and I, you saw this in no clearer than the European elections, the most recent ones, where Marine Le Pen and the alternative for Deutschland uh, in Sweden, there the, were the, the New Democrats, I think they're called, and then uh, Holland, a whole load of places where there was a, a populist revolt where the people said, I'm, I ain't putting up with this anymore. And the EU's response through Ursula von der Leyen, who's the European head of the European Commission, she turned around and she said, we will basically unite against a uh, former bloc, against the extremes of left and right. So that to me was them saying, we will once again put our head in the clouds or so far up our own bottoms that uh, I hope it smells nice up there because they refuse point blank to accept that those plebs might have a point, those deplorables might have a point, that actually maybe life is getting worse for people like that. And that's why you're seeing this groundswell of an activist base where young people, the next generation, are voting for the so-called far right because they're saying, my uh, future is harmed by the fact that we are uh, becoming part, swallowed up by some European entity. We are uh, allowing mass migration to come here uh, in places like London, but other European capitals. You see in support for gay rights, for example, to decrease. There's some studies that suggest that that's on, on the on downward trajectory. And all of this can be linked to a globalist pursuit of hyperliberalism. And it's not working for people. And if you want to call that populist, call it whatever you want. I don't care. But I'm on the side of those people. I'm on the side of making life better for them. Because if you want to get a house, if you want to get a doctor's appointment, if you want to uh, get a job even, my, my brother's in and out of, he's 11 months younger than I am. My mother apparently couldn't hang about. And uh, he's in and out of factory work. And uh, he's always competing with people from, other parts of the world mm -hmm. uh, and they're able to work that are willing to work for wages lower than what he would be expecting in a field like a uh, welding and manufacturing working with your hands is an incredibly uh rewarding thing for a, for a man to do you know my grandfather was a miner mm. uh, my mother was brought up in an era where concert where I was born has a had a steelworks, massive steelworks. That closed down. Yeah. In my mother's lifetime, if you think about all of those industries and and things that have disappeared, why wouldn't you look at everything that's happened and thought, I can't say with my hand on my heart, despite the fact that I keep being told the country's getting richer, that my life is getting richer. It feels like things are getting worse even though you keep telling me that GDP is on an upward trajectory, it doesn't feel like I am materially better off. So I'm with those people and uh, call it whatever you want, really. I, 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 don't, I don't care. But I suppose the problem sometimes, and I think you pointed out that often the sort of popular side, BNP being an example, um, but also the, the Brexit thing. But I wouldn't say BNP are... Uh, populist. I wouldn't, uh, okay. because they're not popular, right? They, they, I don't think there's a groundswell. In 2009, there was a scare about it. All they did was get him on question time and David yeah. Dimbleby gave him a good seeing to, and that was it really, mm. uh, so to speak, uh, <laughs> and uh, asked him a few hard-hitting questions and he wasn't able to answer them. He was like yeah. a, a goldfish out of a bowl. That's true. That's true. Well, Brexit though, I, I feel like Sometimes with populism, it's it's. I know in Argentina, for example, there was this big promise of football for everyone. Yeah, it was a populist right, yeah. little gambit. They didn't promise that during Brexit, <laughs> <laughs> but they gave it in Argentina for whatever reason because they knew they knew that would be a huge vote winner that people could watch the football. 
uh, because it had to be on a free TV channel, which was also the government channel, so then they could put in their adverts about the government and all that kind of thing. Um, and that kind of populism. And so with Brexit, there was sort of this thing of that we're going to curb uh, immigration by leaving the EU. But I don't know if that was ever likely to be true. And immigration has gone up. Or, or, or should it have been? It, well, it should have been true. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we promised the public. Mm. I, I voted a Conservative in 2019 with gusto. You know, I campaigned for a few of my friends who are now members of parliament, soon not to be. Uh, and I was really proud to have been a part of, of helping them. I was really proud of what Boris Johnson said to people and the fact that you know my my grandfather in, in 2017 trade unionist labor man how could you not be if you worked in, down the pit right it came with the territory he voted his last vote was 2017 and he voted conservative for that useless Theresa May and uh, he pulled us to one side and he said um I've got something to tell you and I thought oh, what's this and uh, he said I'm going to vote for her and I said, who's her? He said, I'm going to, because I never expected it would be Theresa May. Yeah. And he said, I'm going to vote uh, conservative for, for that Theresa May. And I, I nearly fell down backwards. And that for me was the start of it, right? That was the realignment happening in real time. Um, uh, despite the fact that, as I, as I just said, you know, I could, you could see it, but I was far too young to understand that things were changing in, in that direction. But we promised people that we would give them greater purchase over their lives, that a vote for, at the ballot box, as you've done in 2010, as you've done in 2015, as you've done in 2017, as you've done in 2019, that the pledges and promises that politicians have consistently made to you would be respected at the ballot box and that Brexit mm. would be the tool, the enabler, to allow us to actually do that, which is true. Brexit did give us those tools, the flexibility to do that, but we haven't used it, right? We haven't fulfilled that promise. I accept that. In that sense, I guess you could argue, you could say right now that Brexit has been a failure, but I would also argue that Brexit hasn't been delivered mm. um, in, in a meaningful sense, because we've said to everyone, you know, come here, study, bring over every Tom, Dick and Harry that you want to, uh, I even saw some stats saying that people from India, which has a space program, you know, they're coming over in small boats. And you just think we have gone so far beyond, and I know that's a, there's a difference between legal and illegal immigration, of course, mm. uh, but both have gone up, right? Both have massively gone up uh, at, to record levels. Uh, the ONS figures were down this year and Rishi Sunak said, oh, goody, goody, look what I've managed to do. I think they'll be revised. Because the ONS did this last year, that's the official stats uh, accountant, I guess, and uh, they revised last year's to record levels. And I think, I think, uh, or the year before rather, and I think last year's will be the same. They'll be revised and say, "Oh, look at all those people we missed." Um, oh, quite possibly, I'm sure. But a lot of people are annoyed, going, "Well, look, we were getting immigration from. If we're going to have to have it, which it seems that government after government is insisting we do for whatever reason, it might be, I suppose, to uh, help with the aging population and to just have a sort of stop gap and just fill with young workers. People would prefer to have from Europe, where they have maybe more similar social cohesion and things to what we have here. Well, I mean, the language barrier still applies to yeah. some parts of Europe. Uh, I. I'm not. I'm not. I don't think that was the ever the the issue. Really, I think the issue. Why are we not paying care workers in this country a wage that's livable? Why are we not saying to them, "You do something that is incredibly difficult, like being a carer is not a walk in the park. Looking after someone at their most vulnerable is incredibly difficult, uh, oh, yeah. and we pay them a pittance." Uh, um, and I think that's totally unacceptable. Business and the, there will be the care homes that operate as businesses, of course, who have been allowed to have a free lunch from mass migration have said, oh, goody, goody, let's just get people from elsewhere. Why bother with the native population and have to maybe pay them wages mm. and they'll unionize and it'll just be very annoying. Let's not bother with that. And we've just said, we'll not bother. So when people say to me, oh, well, the care sector, you know, wages will have to go up. I remember Stuart Rose, he was, used to be the uh, chairman of the CEO of Marks and Spencer. And he said during the EU referendum, wages would go up. And he said that as if like that was a reason not to vote leave. Interesting. And I just thought, 
you that you are so naive, you are so completely out of touch that you've no idea what you've just said. Well, one is incredibly helpful to the Brexit argument, but secondly, part of a wider systemic problem that we simply do not value the people we're already meant to care for the most in the world, and instead just say, well, there's this open market that we've got unfettered access to, so let's bring those people over and to hell with the Brits. Yeah. Wages will go up. What a what a vote loser. Or, you uh, know, yeah, exactly. That's so funny. I've got one more question for you, but first tell me, where can people follow your stuff and get hold of you? Oh, it's, uh, I mean, just search Darren Grimes in whatever platform you use. Tinder. It, oh, no, not that one. I'm actually, I'm banned from that as well. I think that was just vexatious. I'm not dodgy, I promise. But I think that was vexatious I've report. about you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was just think people saying, I, that, I recognize who that is, oh, conservative, oh, no oh, way. Get rid okay, of that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Bomb. But not. No, it doesn't matter. People don't. Have hinge, hinge. Hinge. I'm on Hinge. Get but, on Hinge. Uh, but on, you know, X is the biggest platform. Uh, and uh, I'm a bit addicted to that. But on there, yeah. Yeah, we're on there a lot. Aren't yeah. Oh, we? so yeah, definitely. Typing all the things. Yeah. Um, who's a heretic you admire? John Lilburn, who uh, was born in Sunderland, but I forgive him for that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> as a Newcastle United fan. Yeah. Uh, and. For a very good reason, you know, I I went through much smaller scale court battles. In I had a court case against the Electoral Commission after Brexit, uh, and I felt like that was a to be, you know, Darren versus Goliath. Hmm. Uh, but what John Lilburn went through in his life and consistently put himself through, right? Whether that be in, in advance in ideas of around freedom and liberty, he basically propagated the idea that your rights aren't determined by a uh, a king or a, a Lord Protectorate, uh, Oliver Cromwell or whoever else. It's you, They are God-given, right? You are born and you are born with these rights that we must protect. Uh, habeas corpus, all of these really important principles that we take for granted, all stem from what John Lilburn in his 42 years of life managed to actually do. And he actually, he was imprisoned several times throughout his life, but he never gave up. Even in prison, he refused to relent, to say to whether it be uh, a monarch or whether it be Cromwell, uh, that he would not seek to be a problem, a problem by advancing these ideas and uh, really important laudable aims in his work that he would just shut up basically and go away. And I think that's incredibly admirable. And I wish we had today more people who were willing to say, I will not be silenced. I actually think there is a really important principle at stake here and that Britain ought to be a country that always remembers that. And we have him to thank for an awful lot of those things. He was ultimately imprisoned on Jersey and the conditions were so awful that you know, with the tide coming in and the, he was covered in seawater, goodness only knows, so there was damp on the walls. He ended up dying, mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably of uh, typhus or something like that. Uh, two years after he was released from this Jersey prison in this beautiful castle. But 42 years on this planet, and look at that life. He's, he's even been referenced in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, you know, the founding fathers even referencing wow. and all the rest of it. So not bad for a lad from Sunderland. Yeah, yeah. You've got 10 years to make such an inbox. 12, <laughs> I've got seven years. Um, <laughs> I haven't done much Good yet. Luck. It's got to be a bloody cracking seven years. People, please go and follow Darren Grimes on Twitter. We'll have a link below. Keep on, hit the like and the subscribe over there and keep on watching this channel for similar things. <laughs>